Greetings, everyone. Welcome to IKG's Wisdom Wednesday. I am Sister Ajwa, the coordinator of the IKG Wisdom Wednesday program. Wisdom Wednesday program. We are so happy that you are able to join us this evening. For those of you who may or may not know, Wisdom Wednesday is a free lecture series that we hold every third Wednesday of the month. And since 2020, we've been holding it via Zoom webinar. And we have been able to bring in our family from all over the world to join us in these great presentations related to African history, culture, spirituality, politics, all issues affecting us as Black people and looking at ways that we can find solutions for our own lives and our communities. So as always, we'd like to start off by acknowledging where you all are checking in from, where are you joining us from, and we ask that you just share in the chat um, where, where you are. And as you are doing that, I would like to let you all know that as we go through this presentation tonight, um, we do have the chat box for us to interact with each other. However, if you do have a question for our presenter this evening, we ask that you put those questions in the Q&A box. And as um, you all are checking in, we have LA, Los Angeles, California. Thank you. We have North Carolina, Fairfax, Virginia. Silver Spring, Maryland is in the house. Um, someone asked, um, is that Phila Kuti? Yes, that, is Phila, that was Phila Kuti, um, single water that was playing in the beginning. We have Philly, of course, DC. We have New York City in the house. Uh, let's see, Jersey, South Carolina, Texas, Cali again, Colorado, Maryland, Wisconsin. Let's see here, Delaware, uh, Virginia again, Florida, Oklahoma. All right, Oklahoma, England, all right, from across the waters, we have England, Missouri, Georgia, Georgia again, San Francisco, New York again, Delaware. We're just calling and shouting everybody out. Brooklyn in the house. Shreveport, Chicago, uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. All right, so we are representing all over. We got some in the north, some in the south, east, west, and internationally. So thank you all again for joining us this evening. Tonight's program, we have for you Dr. Kwesi Amoa, and his title is, Are You Ready for When Hits the Fan? Tonight's presentation uh, aims to motivate the audience to take charge of their food security and survival. In the first half of the talk, Dr. Amoa will discuss the laws put in place to suppress the movement and actions of Black people. And the second half of the talk will provide tips for foraging and describe steps one should take for basic survival skills. Dr. Kwesi Amoa is a skilled organic chemist trained in the isolation, synthesis, and characterization of natural products. Over the years, his research interests have shifted from the synthesis of antiviral and anti-carcinogenic agents to environmental chemistry and chemical education. As a tool to assist his students in understanding chemical concepts, he created Chem Solutions, a series of online videos. This work has generated more than 1 million views on YouTube. Currently, he serves as executive director for Recycle for Education, a non for profit that provides recycling opportunities for the Southeast community. In this role, he runs the day to day operation of the organization, and educates the public about the tremendous financial opportunities recycling can provide. He is a strong advocate of environmental justice and the fair treatment of people of color on issues related to the environment. He is a published author of both print and electronic media. In 2014, he co-authored Beneficial Use of Brown Grease, a source of petroleum derived in the New England Water Associate Journal. In addition, he co-authored 
Laboratory Experiments in Chemistry for Health Professionals, second edition. He is the vice chair to the South Queens Park Association and serves as a chairperson for the Denizulu Cultural Arts Institute. Dr. Amoa received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Arts degrees in chemistry from Fisk University, and he earned his doctorate in organic chemistry from Howard University. He has certifications from the Wharton School of Business in integrating finance, marketing, and finance, and accounting for non-finance managers. And he is married to his college sweetheart, Andrea Amoa Esquire, and is a proud father of three. Please join me in welcoming tonight's presenter, Dr. Kwesi Amoa. Thank you for that warm introduction. Absolutely. Uh, I see we have a pretty good audience, so I'm, I'm excited about this. How's everyone doing out there? Jeff, could just wave your hands or whatever the emojis you yeah, have out there. I'm going to get started on my, um, my presentation. We actually have somebody from Canada. So one of the things that I was doing this talk, I was like, well, I don't know where the people are going to be coming from. So it's going to make it a little interesting in terms of being able to do that. So, but I think I have some good information that, that should be able to be shared all over for everyone to see. Okay, can everyone see my, my presentation? Yes. Please, you can see it, you're good? Yes, I'm good. So, Sister Adjua asked me to do this presentation, I guess a few months ago. She asked about it kind of earlier on and I was like, eh, I don't really know, but I'm like, all right, okay. So as you guys have heard my bio, I am an organic chemist by training. So, but as a hobbyist, one of the things that I am very interested in doing and dealing with is natural products and um, dealing with the earth. Uh, um, so, over the years, I've accumulated this knowledge about plant life and, and different things in terms of being prepared for when the grid goes down, when things happen that we aren't necessarily ready for it to happen. So my biggest contention is that one, I don't, I am not going to rely on the government to um, save me because we have a history of them not doing that. So with that being said, I will go into why I feel this way. So if we look at this here, the government is not going to help us. They have been actively engaged in suppressing the brilliance of black people. So, and I'm gonna give you a quick little timeline as to what this looked like and things that have happened. And by no means is this exhaustive, is this all the things that happened, but these are some key things that stick in my head that you know I want to um, relay to the audience that as you're developing this, you should be thinking about this. So in 1619, we had our first enslaved Africans to hit these shores, 1864, we had, quote unquote, the 13th Amendment, but of course they put a loophole in it. And with the loophole was that if you become um, captured or you was jailed, you were put back into slavery for the most part. Um, in 1865, supposedly 1863, slavery ended according to the US laws. And then as soon as slavery ended, they came up with the Black Code, which was from 1865. And I'm not really sure, sure how long that went through. But from 1865 to 1877, we had a period of reconstruction. So if you ever look into the archives and see some of the history, that's when you had a whole lot of Black people were elected to office. You had a lot of things happening that was beneficial for black people but however it was an attempt to deal with racial inequalities but um, i don't think it was very successful and then from 1870 to 1865 we had jim crow laws 
So my father grew up in Jim Crow era. He is what, 70 something years old now. And I'm sure a lot of other people on here who parents grew up in that era. So 1865 is only 54 years ago. It's not that long ago. So um, we have these uh, vagrancy laws that led to convict leasing. And I mean, it's a whole history that's behind that. 1914, we looked at the present to the present back to Africa movement. So I guess it kind of started in 1914. And I'm sure there were more people that were trying to get back to Africa prior to this. But I guess from a historical perspective, this is when it becomes big. And then in 1954 to 1968, we have our civil rights movement. And then from 1970 to present, and I'm calling this the new Jim Crow. This is when we started dealing with this war on drugs, the Rockefeller drug laws and things of that nature. And we still see we're having incidents or we're still having um, disproportionately being affected by these things. Um, despite the attempt to uh, equalize things, that's not necessarily happening. So my question to the audience is, and in 2013, we had um, Black Lives Matter movement to today is still going on and we're still protesting about the equal treatment of Black people in this country. So it has been 400 plus years that we have been in this country Black folks are not strangers to white folks. We have been here for a while, yet we are still struggling to be treated fairly and to be equal or just treated fairly. Um, you have to be two, three, four times better in order to get the same thing that they have, which is just not fair. And we know that it's not fair. So, my question to the audience is, you know, when are we going to, and I think the reason why the civil rights movement was so powerful is because it was really based on economics, not necessarily based on we being fair and folks wanting to be fair to give, um, white folks wanting to be fair to let folks ride on the bus or whatever. What really became the issue is that them white folks got tired of not getting their money for their buses and said, look, let them sit anywhere as long as they give me their nickel. That's where the real power is. And when do we as black folks start using our economic power to demand the things that we want in this country? So, uh, and, I, and, I, and I think that's critical. So despite the gains that we have over the year, we have more millionaires, more black billionaires in any time in history. We still have greater health disparities in general population, more likely to be denied funding, less life expectancy, more likely to be jailed, more likely to have families separated and children removed, dealing with the court system. Our young women are more likely to be sexualized for just being kids. I mean, the disparities can go on and on. So I'm sure I don't have to go through a whole lecture, but it's, these are the things that we're dealing with. So I say all this to say that the laws are created not to protect you. I say this to say that if you're looking for the laws to be equal, it is a joke. The laws are designed in a way to provide a group an unfair advantage, period. And we see this over and over again in terms of what the um, government has done and how, you know, with even with the tax codes, you know, there's special carve outs for certain organizations to have certain tax breaks based on their organization and the things that they're doing or whatever they're producing. The laws are not designed to be fair. They're designed to provide a, um, um, a group with an unfair advantage. So I keep seeing this brother, Derek, um, popping up with his hand. 
he has a question or he's raising his hand. Um, sister, could you ask the brother what it is that he's asking? What's the question? Um, brother, if you do have a question, you can place it in the Q&A box and we can get to that question um, during the Q&A. But if you raise your hand, um, we will not be able to um, have you actually speak with the as a panelist, but if you do type in your question or type in your comment in the chat box, um, that will allow us to see it. Thank you. Okay, so so I said the laws are not designed to protect you. And then I, I'm reading these books. Um, Michelle Alexander and Ellie Miss do allow me to retort, and I quote the laws. And I have in quotation, it was written by a collection of wealthy slavers, wealthy colonizers, and wealthy anti-slavery white men who were nonetheless willing to compromise and profit together with slavers and colonizers. Okay, so this is the Constitution of the United States that was written. So understanding this was the premise of our quote unquote laws were written. Again, I'm gonna say it again. It was written by a collection of wealthy slavers, wealthy colonizers, wealthy anti-slavery white men who were nonetheless willing to compromise and profit together with slavers and colonizers. So this is by Ellie Mistel. He just put out his book, Allowed Me to Retort. And it's a, a fascinating read in terms of looking at the Constitution of the United States and all these laws and how you know, the laws are manipulated again to provide someone uh, unfair advantage. And then the second quote I have here is from Michelle Alexander. And it says, like Jim Crow and slavery, mass incarceration operates as a tightly networked system of laws policies, customs, and institutions that operate collectively to ensure subordinate status of a group defined largely by race. So I thought that was, it's, it's not just one thing, it's a collection of things that are put in place to make these things or to put forth this, um, this system that we're in. We, we live in this system. And as a result of living in the system, we have to deal with these collections of laws, these customs, and then it's all arbitrary, really. Like who, who's the judge? Who interprets the law? Is how it ends up going down and saying and providing an advantage for whoever the person on the other side or not on the other side depends. So, so I say all that to set the premise of this conversation is that one. If something, if the shit hits the fan, me personally, I'm not looking for the government to come and be able to be a savior. We've seen examples of this. We have Katrina, for example, in Louisiana, when all them folks were down there with the flooding and how they were treated. I mean, we have countless of examples of when natural disaster affects our community, how we're treated. I just read an article the other day that talked about when the people were supposed to get some money to help um, elevate their houses from the water, the government gave them $30,000 to elevate it. There wasn't enough money to do the elevation. So they were told that they could use the money for repairs. The government is now suing them for the $30,000 because they did not raise the money, raise their houses the 15 feet that they wanted them to raise it. But you were told that you could use this money to do repairs to your house. You don't necessarily have to raise it. This is what you was informed, yet the government is going after these black and brown people for this money. Again, it's, in, it's incredible. The atrocities are incredible. But that's not the, the premise of this conversation. I'm saying all of this to put you in the mindset of saying, hey, if you're looking for the government to come and get you out of something, Good luck. So the whole point of this conversation is whether or not you're ready for when the shit hits the fan, right? So emergency essentials. 
And I'm looking at this in terms of just sheltering in place. Sheltering in place, you have a disaster, you're sheltering in place. What are the things that you're gonna be able to do and or need? So one, canned goods is an essential. So the average person needs somewhere between two to 3000 calories per day. So what you can do is multiply, you know, how many people is in your family and multiply that times four or five, which will give you an idea of the number of calories that you would need in order to survive. So in an emergency situation, I put this up here as just say, say for a week, two weeks, you're sheltering in place. So we just had an experience of what sheltering in place was like in terms of what the COVID was, having enough water. So for example, when we have some major storm that's coming into New York and we know that the power is going to get um, knocked out or whatever, we'll fill our bathtub with water, for example, to make sure that we have enough water, whether it's drinking water, bathing water, whatever it might be in order to just get through that time period. Batteries to operate, flashlight and radios, um, warm blanket, first aid kit, knife to open up canned food, cash just in case. So the this here is just for an emergency situation that's going to be a quick thing. And you're looking at maybe a, a week, two week type scenario, which normally what happens here in the United States, if there's a disaster, it's generally something that happens within the week and you're prepared, you can prepare yourself to deal with that situation. However, I'm thinking about this from a much, much longer term scenario. So the average person in the United States, or not United States, around the world can survive off of a dollar a day. So we have examples in India, China, Africa, South America, and you even have examples here in America where a person can literally live off of a dollar a day. So the basic needs and the things that we need to shelter is water and food. But with, with sheltering in place, this is, a, you know, it's, you already have your shelter. So the other thing that really becomes the big thing is your food. Some items that you might want to have just in case, a shotgun, axe, machete. But the biggest consideration in all of this is knowing your environment. Where can you find food? Where can you find water? Those are, that's the biggest thing more so than anything else. You have your shelter because you're sheltered in place. The next biggest question is where could I find food? Where can I find water? So I want us to remember that our ancestors survived slavery. So survival is in our DNA. It is there, it has to be awakened, but our parents came through the worst part. Our ancestors came through the worst part of slavery, shackled slavery, come across those boats and we survive. So survival is part of who we are genetically. So there's nothing to fear, just understand that it's a part of you. So things you can do to increase your food security. So I already mentioned knowledge of your environment. So I just, I saw some, um, somebody that was from California. We were just out there, my wife and I. And right now they have, I think it's called Jacaranda tree. I never saw the tree before. It's a big, beautiful um, plant. It's a tree that has purple flowers on it right now. And I'm like, what tree is that? I've never seen a tree with purple flowers. So knowing your environment is critical because those are the things that are actually going to help you and save you. While we were in California, there was a bunch of and I'm sure it's a plant that's either in the cabbage family or the turnip family that was growing on the side of the road and it had the yellow flowers. They were all over the place. The place is dry. So knowing your environment is critical. That's why like you have to know what are those things in your environment that you can do. So um, the concept of food shortage is a myth. We have been taught that you have to go to the grocery store to get your food. And you know the government, the media, they're very good at manipulating us to have runs on the store. Whenever a storm is gonna come, everybody runs like crazy, buy up all the milk, buy up all the eggs, buy up all the bread, as if the food is gonna run out. I mean, they love it because it's like, okay, a storm is coming. Everybody's gonna run through the store. 
So some of the th things that you need to be able to do or some of the skills that you need to develop are canning, learning how to can your food. This is something that I actually learned from my grandmother because she, she makes something called cha-cha. And um, cha-cha is for cabbage. They used to cut it up, boil it, put sugar or spices in it, and then they'll jar it. And then they'll eat that throughout the winter. But I actually learned how to can from my grandmother. Um, fishing, fishing, easy to learn. It's inexpensive, but learning to be able to secure your own food source. Crabbing is also very easy. Salting techniques, learning how to preserve your meat throughout the winter. Smoking, using a grill to smoke your food. Gardening, planting fruit trees and trapping. These are all things that will increase your food security all things that you can learn, all things that are easy to do. It's just a matter of taking the time, taking the time to learn your environment and um, prepare yourself, learn how to do these things so that just in case you're able to uh, provide food for yourself and family. So COVID-19 came and we've all been locked up for the um, or partially locked up, depending on what state you were in. Everybody was shut in and whatever. Everybody had a ran, they had went and got all the toilet paper, got all the groceries. Myself, when all that happened, I didn't, I did everything like I normally did. It wasn't no big deal to me. I wasn't really concerned. I wasn't concerned about my family, none of that stuff because of the things that I had already done to make sure that we, we had plenty. You still got plenty. As a matter of fact, it's, we have plenty of food in our refrigerator. We have plenty of stuff canned, you know, in case something happens. My wife, she actually says, stop canning all this stuff. She wants to yell at me. So, um, but COVID-19, when the shut-in came, is a prime example of, um, you know, how people reacted to not being able to get to the grocery store. And it's really not necessary. But having said that, there are literally hundreds of wild edibles that are free for the taking for you to consume. The only thing that you need to be able to do is increase your knowledge as to what those things are. So here is some foods that um, you can pick, and this list is by no means exhaustive. So depending on your area, it's going to change on you know, what those things by me. But again, that's why I said from the beginning, know what's your knowledge base, know your area, know your environment, where you can find food. There's tons, I'm telling you, tons of stuff that's all around you that you can eat and consume and it's healthier for you and it probably tastes better than the stuff you're getting out of the grocery store. So in the spring, for example, Japanese knotweed. Japanese knotweed is an invasive plant, but um, it tastes pretty good. It's all over the place. Um, people, when you see it, they want you to pull it up, but it's an edible plant. Um, bamboo is another thing that's edible. It's start Right now it's starting to shoot. You're starting to get the shoots that are coming up. I have some in my backyard that's growing up now. Um, dandelion, garlic mustard, purple dead nettle, henbit, chickweed, cle cle cleavers, bitter crest, wild onions. I mean, there's a lot of things out there. And, and like, again, this list is by no means exhaustive. It is just a small thing. And these are the things that I'm just seeing in my area and I'm still learning. I'm still discovering things as I'm on this journey of food security. Um, all my Caribbean people out there, we got Kalaloo pigweed. Um, pigweed is exactly that. It is a weed. It grows everywhere. So you definitely will see it. When I was in Texas, I saw it in Texas. I know that I've seen it in um, Florida. It's all on the eastern seaboard um, in terms of, and it's, a, and it's like spinach. It's really, really good. Purslane. Purslane is a very succulent plant to eat. Um, very good. Pokeweed. Um, pokeweed is one of those things you have to have the knowledge of it. If you eat it raw, 
or if you eat it without boiling it three times, you will get very sick. So again, this whole process is um, knowing your environment. And then once you know your environment, then you want to be able to um, know what those things are. So you're providing yourself a knowledge base in order to be able to do that. So in the fall, you have acorns, hickory nuts, black nuts, chickweeds, wild onions, wild grapes that are available to be consumed. Um, you even have, um, uh, what's, the, what's the plant, the yellow flowers? I can't think of it right now that you could even eat that. I just discovered that not too long ago. But there's like, again, there's tons and tons of things that are capable of being um, that are edible and they're free. And then that's, that's the key thing. So if you remember, back in the day our ancestors were hunter gatherers so they work for three hours a day go out collect their food and the rest of the day they chilled and they relaxed we work eight hours a day 40 hours a week so that we could put food on our table so i mean i don't know what was better and then we the people probably there were a lot more healthier than we are now so i i want to stop this for a second i want to share um, one of the websites. So if you go online, this here is called Julia's Edibles Plants, just to give you an idea of like the, the ton, the, the stuff that's out there. Wild strawberry, this is amaranth seeding. This is um, Kalalua pigweed. This is it right here as well. See the thing, bitter crest. These are things that you've probably seen and you just didn't recognize it. You probably have it in your yard. Dandelions, I'm sure everyone sees dandelions. They have it in their yard. You can eat the flowers, you can eat the seeds, you can eat the roots, you can uh, make coffee grinds from the roots, um, a coffee substitute, tons like this, tons and tons of stuff that, that's available that can be eaten. Um, so this here is just a, a list of different plants and flowers and as you can see, there are plenty of things. And again, depending on your area where you are, you may have some of these, you may not, but you will definitely have probably way, way more than you need in terms of being able to, to eat, to being able to survive, being able to collect foods that you can provide for your family. So another thing that you can do to do with your fuel security is to plant a garden, um, depending on where you live. Even you can even plant a garden out of a pot. You know, um, you can use a bucket on them Home Depot buckets, five gallon bucket. You can plant peppers, squash, tomatoes. You'll be surprised what will grow inside of a little bucket, and then the amount of food that you get is always incredible. It's always so much that you cannot eat it all. So some of the easy things to, to plant are peppers, tomatoes, squash, butternut squash. This is a late harvest, but you get these beautiful butternut squash and you can, they'll last all winter. You can make soups out of them. I mean, they're beautiful things. They're beautiful they're, they're, and they're very good. One of the things last year, my family, we planted broccoli. Um, and this is the first time we've actually planted broccoli. And I was so shocked to eat the broccoli that it tasted like a thousand times better than the broccoli we got from the grocery store. So normally when we go to the grocery store, we look for the broccoli to make sure it hasn't seeded and is little and all this type of stuff. And you know, we could try to get the young tender broccoli. This broccoli, I had let it seed, I had let it flower, and it still was better than anything that I had ever bought from the grocery store, which really gets me to thinking like, what are we eating at the grocery store? What are they giving us in terms of this mass production of food? Um, one of my favorite things to grow are greens. So collard greens, mustard, turnips, cabbage, all these things will survive the winter. So you can plant them in the summer, you can, eat them pretty much all winter, as long as the center does not get cold, doesn't get cold in it. And then um, 
you're, you're able to consume it. I mean, um, the mustard greens, they'll come back. You can plant them in the spring. You can harvest them all summer, cut them down, and you will still get a harvest even in the fall because they're cold weather plants, which, which is good. The beans, beans are very easy to grow. Um, string beans, llama beans, again, the amount of food that you get as a result of, and it doesn't take a whole lot, is the production is generally off the chain. So my family, when we plant our garden every year, we end up giving away probably 80% of the food that we end up growing because we just have so much and we cannot eat it all. So that's when that preserving aspect comes in place, canning and pickling and all type of stuff. All right, another easy thing to do, which, which definitely bears fruit is planting fruit trees. So apple trees and pear trees are probably the two easiest trees that you can plant. Peach trees are pretty good as well um, in terms of they produce um, pretty good fruit. Persimmons, I don't know if you ever have persimmons. People from the South normally know about persimmons. Figs are actually amazing. In the Northeast, they grow very, very, very slow. So um, it might not be, if you're gonna plant this, you're gonna have to wait a few years for you to get the, um, get the I've tried planting fig trees years and every winter they end up dying. Plums are good. Um, as well, but they have some fungi uh, that are associated with it, which creates problems. I have some grapes in my yard right now. I planted the grapes like five years ago, and I think <laughs> I got like about four grapes out of the whole time since I've had it, but it's supposed to have been like within a three-year period, it's supposed to start producing, but it's still there, so I'm going to see what happened. Cherry trees, cherry trees are really also good. Um, in June, you guys will probably start seeing mulberries, mulberry trees for people on the eastern seaboard. Um, mulberries, they stay in season for about, I would say about a good three weeks. Mulberry trees are delicious. They're wild. I've never figured out why they have not became commercial um, and why they aren't commercial, but they're all over the place. And it's a very, very good source of food. The other thing, and this is really going to depend on the type of place where you live and your space, is to raise your own chickens. So currently, I have probably about maybe 60 chickens in my yard, and I just hatched out some more. Um, the one thing that's beautiful about chickens, one hen will lay about 100 eggs a year. So I always end up pickling a whole bunch of eggs because I like the eggs and I'll consume them throughout the winter time when this hen starts stops laying. But right now we're probably getting at least a dozen eggs a day um, and we're giving them away because we, we can't even eat them, there's so much. And the other part of that is that you have the meat that comes from the chickens. So um, we generally don't cull our chickens because we want them for eggs, but if you're able to, and you have the ability to have chickens in your yard, I would strongly recommend it. They're really, really easy to raise. They're not fussy animals. Um, depending on where you are, you might not, cannot have a rooster, but um, the chickens, the, the hens will still lay eggs, even if there's no rooster. The eggs would just become fertilized with the rooster. But for those people who do not eat eggs or who do eat eggs, if you taste a fresh chicken versus a store-bought chicken egg, again, it's night and day. My wife doesn't like eggs, but she will eat these eggs because the taste is so much better, so much different. So if you have that ability to do that, I would certainly recommend it. Um, it, it again, it makes a big difference uh, in terms of being able to have that food security. Another question is, do you have a barbecue grill? Do you have a grill in your yard? Do you have a propane tank with a fryer attached to it? I think these are two essential pieces of equipment that you're going to need if 
you're going to shelter at home. So normally around this time, Home Depot normally has puts the charcoal on sale of like three for ten dollars or something like that. We end up normally buying a nice little hefty amount so we can barbecue during the summer, but also in the event that we do need it, we still we have extra that we can cook with for anything that happens. So I definitely think this is a um, a, a must have for you um, in, in case of emergency, something's going on, you want to be able to at least have a little barbecue grill, throw it on and cook you something to eat real quickly. All right, other things to consider, do you have a team? your family and your friends, I mean, who will help you? I mean, who, who are the people that you are gonna help with this knowledge? For me, it's my son. So I, um, pretty much everything I've learned, I've taught him and he's actually a lot better in some of the stuff than I am. He's kind of surpassed my knowledge to some degree, especially with fishing. This kid is amazing with fishing. He fishes better than I am. I call him Fred Flintstone because now you know, he can throw rocks in the water and <laughs> catch fish and everybody around him is not pulling up anything with this guy's fishing circles around everybody else. But again, that's a question for you to have. Who, who's your team? Who do you have that you're going to be working with? Do you want to develop a team or, you, you know, in terms of the knowledge that you need in order to deal with this? Another thing to consider is how much money are you going to need? Do you really need money? I mean, it's probably good to have some, but what does that look like? And for each family, that's going to look differently. A thousand dollars, maybe. I mean, I don't know. That's going to be an individual decision. Another thing is, are you planning to evacuate your home? And if you do to have evacuate your home, do you have enough fuel to get to your destination? So the average car will go about 400 miles on a full tank of gas. So where are you trying to get to if you're not going to shelter in place? And then when you do get to your destination, do you have all the things that you need there in order to be able to live off the land? And then another question is who will come with you? You know, is this going to be your immediate family? Who are the people that you want to be with you during this time? So but these are all questions to be considered, all questions to be discussed. So this 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 topic is a heavy topic because we don't think of um, anything really ever happening. But I think, given the history of this country, that it should be in the back of our minds in terms of what it is that we need to do to be able to survive, and not just survive, thrive in the environment that we're in. So. Another big part of it, I think, is the mindset for those people that are traditionalists, you know, the use of your shrines and your ancestors to guide you, to help you within terms of keeping your stress levels down. Um, if you go back to the history of some of these shrines and many of these shrines, they were there as a way of helping man to cope and live in his environment. So this is a resource or a tool that should not be overlooked in terms of um, dealing with this situation. Like, what does that look like and how does it happen? And what are the other resources that you have in place in order for this to happen? So in summary, some of the things you want to look at is sheltering in place. Is your home secure? Do you know your environment? Knowing your environment is critical. Can you secure the food if there's no grocery store? Raise your meat, chickens, lamb, goat. Are you able to do that? Do you have basic supplies? Gas, charcoal, canned food? Are you prepared to deal without electricity? Candles, flashlights? What are the things that you're gonna need to get you through that intermittent part of, you know, okay, I'm on my own. I gotta deal with this type of stuff. Can you make a fire? What does that look like? Can you heat? Can you heat your home? Can you heat your facility, your vicinity, wherever you might be? So these are some of the things that you should definitely consider. And then again, I think the biggest thing is knowing your environment in order to be able to secure the food that you need in order uh, to um, survive. So. 
some of the suggested readings. Um, Slavery by Another Name by Douglas Blackman. I think this is a, a really good book that talks about the laws and how the laws were used just to do what folks wanted to do. You could walk down the street and tell a black man, you owe me money. That was it. You owe me money, you're going to jail. Now you work for me. You know, some just ridiculous stuff. But I would definitely suggest reading it. The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, which if, if you don't want to read the book on Netflix, they have the 13th, um, which is still there. I would strongly recommend watching it. The Black Tax by Sean Rochester. Uh, it's a really, really good book that talks about the laws and how much um, economic uh, power Black folks were robbed of over the years. So when we look at, we talk about restorations, what does that look like? And what is the dollar amount to that? This is what it looks like. Allow Me to Retort by Ellie Mistel. I think that's an excellent book to look at. And then I have a few websites listed here, juliusedibleweeds.com, outdoorlife.com, ediblewildlife.com as a way for you to start your foraging journey. So I'm giving you my experience in terms of what I've done. So by no means am I quote unquote a survival expert, but I guarantee you if something was to go down, my family would be in pretty good shape uh, in terms of dealing you know, with whatever the situation that was to go on. So with that said, I will take questions. I have left my email address there for those people who are interested and would like to reach out to me. If you want to call me, you surely you're more than healthy, more than welcome to do so. I will probably respond to text faster than a call, depending because I get so many calls, but I will get back in contact with you. So with that said, I will open it up and um, I would like to hear what you guys got to say. Any questions or concerns? All right, Grace of Family, please um, post your questions in the Q&A box. That is where I will be looking to um, find questions, find your questions to ask our presenter. So um, I'm going to first start off with a question from Brother Paul Flippin. He wants to know what part of the country do you live in? I know we didn't go over where you're located. You mentioned it. I, I, I'm in New York City, so um, I'm in Long Island. So we've had, yeah, my family, we, we're, we're city country people. That's a, a thing, but that's how we are. But I'm in Long Island, so I'm in the eastern part of the country. So a lot of the stuff that I've identified, you will definitely find in the eastern part of the country. Some of it's found all over the world all over the country. But again, that's one of the things I was saying in terms of knowing your environment and knowing what's in your area is kind of crucial. Okay. Um, the first question that we're going to take is from AJ. And AJ asked several um, questions that I think are really relevant to, um, to, our own, to our understanding as a collective. The first one, on a topic of gathering food from the environment, are road kills an option? And do we need to be concerned about state permits for crabbing, trapping, fishing, et cetera? So um, in, in the short, uh, I would say no. I mean, if the shit hits the fan, um, I don't think the government's gonna be coming out after you saying that you're, you're you know, you need to have a permit, but you do need to have permits to fish. You do need to have permits to trap, um, depending on where you are. So one of the things that I'm talking about trapping, for example, is raccoons and possums. So they're always coming out backyard in our yard where I live. And I'm sure there's probably where you guys live too. You have the same thing. Raccoons and possums are considered nuisance animals. You can trap those kill them and eat them. So the government's not gonna come after you for trapping an animal that they're actually trying to get rid of. But because we're talking about survival and we're talking about you know, being able to provide food for our family, then yes, 
you know, um, I don't I don't think that's going to become a major concern. But in normal times, quote unquote, yes, you would need to have fishing permits. Crabbing, you don't necessarily need to have permits to crab, um, but for fishing, you you do. Um, in New York City or in New York State, you have to have permits to um, freshwater fish. For seawater, for fishing in the ocean, you do not have to have a, a um, you don't have to pay for a permit, but you are required to register. I hope that answered your question. Okay, and um, yes, that definitely answered the question. And along um, those lines, in terms of finding food in the wild, um, what would be your advice about how to clean plants, especially those we collect along the roads in the city? So, I mean, I mean, soapy water is probably your best option in terms of being able to clean plants. So, um, I mean, you want to you want to exercise some level of common sense. I mean, if you collecting stuff off the highway and you see it's a big pollutant area, even when you touch the plant and you touch the plant and you see that there's a bunch of soot on the plant from the exhaust from the um, from the cars and stuff, then that's pretty much a no no. I'm not going to pick that. I'm not going to harvest that because it's already giving me signs so that this is not something that I would. But there are plenty of places where you don't have that type of foot traffic going on where you can find wild edibles. Even just walking in the parks, a lot of the national parks, you'll find a lot of stuff. And even in your backyard, walking around your yard in your house, and you're, you'll find things that is growing that you can actually pick up and consume. So, but soapy water is the general um, rule for washing the material depending on what it is that you're trying to um, collect and how you're gonna collect it. And then there's other things where you can take some of these things and you're making tinctures out of them, meaning you're taking the plant matter, filling it with alcohol and you're using it as a medicine. So one example of that is pokeweed, pokeweed berries. You can use that for arthritis and rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis and um, joint pains. So, but the berries are what you're, cons you're using and you're drinking a little bit of it. You're just putting it into the alcohol and whatever's in there, if it's any parasites or whatever, it's gonna be killed by the alcohol. So again, the knowledge base is critical. Like know what it is that you're doing. You have to educate yourself before you just start going out there. Just make sure just to protect yourself in terms of what it looks like. Along those lines, the question from Mila, Mila Two, and Mila Two asks, "Do you have tips for foraging on the go, like knowing when and where I can and can't pick?" Um, foraging on the go. You mean? Uh, so I'm taking if there was an emergency, and let's say this person is not. Um, they're not homebound, they're perhaps they're just on foot, um, by car, but they need to find food on the go oh, on the road. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, you can do that, but then that goes back to knowing your environment. So what are those things that are edible in your environment? So yes, you can do that. There's plenty of things, for example, um, cat skill, um, um, it's a swampy plant with the um, the brown fuzzy thing. You can eat the roots of those. You can just peel them and eat them raw. Um, but you need. But again, you'll you'll find those depending on where you are. You'll generally see them in um, um, swampy areas, or they'll plant them as decorative decorative plants. But yes, you can do that. But again, it's knowing your environment, like what's what grows in your environment. So for example, the mulberries in June, you'll see mulberry plants all over. You'll see fruiting plants all over the place. So you can probably, like in New York, I could probably walk from my house to Queens and see plants all over the place. And that would be a, a viable food source because it would just be so much. So yes. You can do that, but again, you need to know 
your environment in order to be able to do that and to be able to do it successfully. Okay, now with that, there's a couple of people asking a really um, important question. Um, one is anonymous, one is from um, uh, Jewel Crawford, and they're asking about herbicides and pesticides. How can those be avoided when foraging? And is it better to just grow your own? Well, I will always recommend growing your own, but if you're foraging, you're gonna, you wanna probably really forage in pristine areas where it's pretty much undisturbed. You don't have a lot of foot traffic and people going there. Um, the herbicide material, normally if, if you're going to a park or some area and they're spraying, they're spraying to kill. So you're gonna know that that material has been treated and you're not gonna be able to harvest it to consume. You'll know right away. Um, but my recommendation is, you know, again, depending on where you are, is to grow your own food. And because you're gonna know better than anybody else how that food was grown, what herb besides were placed on it, if any, what did you treat it with? You're gonna know that more so than anybody else. But if you're foraging, uh, my recommendation is to just forage places where it's like off the beaten path. You're not having a lot of people going there or, you know, it's not being treated by, um, the, by, the, by the parks department or something like that. All right. Um, someone is asking, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Someone is asking for your email address. If there's a way people can contact you via email, if you can type that in the chat. And um, yeah, all right. and someone asked about PowerPoint slides being shared. Um, I think if you reach out to Dr. Moa um, individually with any questions, um, I'm certain he'll be able to assist you. Um, but we generally don't share the PowerPoints, but the video of tonight's presentation will be on YouTube. Um, give us about 48 hours and it will be on our YouTube channel. I will post that link in the chat again for everyone, and you will be able to get that information there. Um, so the next question is coming from um, AJ, and AJ would like to know, what do you think about raising quail instead of chickens for eggs and meat? Is that a viable option? Yeah, I mean, you can do that. Quail's a little smaller, but yeah, you can do that. If you're looking for the bang for the buck, chickens are probably the better uh, option, but you can do quails as well. So it just depends on what you do. Some people even do pigeons. Um, so, you, but I mean, you can do quail, but if you're looking for like, what's gonna give me the most protein or the most meat out of this particular product, um, chickens are definitely by far the best, but you can do quails as well. All right. Um, our next question comes from Rakita. She would like to know, do you have any suggestions for growing food living in an apartment? Yes. If you're going to grow food, um, do you have a balcony? Do you have a place where you can grow like tomatoes or peppers. If you're gonna grow it indoors, you can set up a little area for like a greenhouse and you can grow material there. Um, so uh, I guess the question or the, the answer is really gonna depend on what's your space, what's your space like. My suggestion to everybody is to grow tomatoes first. You can grow tomatoes from a hanging bag you can have them grow upside down. I mean, tomatoes are probably the easiest things to grow. And the results are always amazing. So I don't I have not heard anyone who said that they raised their own tomatoes and they wanted to go back and get store-bought tomatoes. So my suggestion would you can raise tomatoes inside your home in one pot. That one plant will probably end up producing about 20 tomatoes. And you're probably going to go bananas like, okay, oh, I can't even eat all these tomatoes. I got too many tomatoes. So, but then you have different varieties of tomatoes. You got beef tomatoes, you got plum tomatoes, you got grape tomatoes. 
Um, you got a whole bunch of different varieties of tomatoes in terms of growing. So you can grow in an apartment, but it does definitely depend on the type of space that you have. To follow up on that, are there, um, you mentioned tomatoes, are there certain types of um, food that one can grow indoors? And then what would um, someone might consider growing on a balcony as a as right. Are there certain types of food that you can grow indoors? Like if you like, if you have plants indoors, like near a window. Let's say, are there certain foods that one can grow inside their apartment? And what could likely, or what could be done on a, in a balcony? What types of foods? Um, so the stuff that you can grow indoors, you can definitely grow outdoors. Um, for example, lettuce, for example, is a pretty is pretty tolerant to being grown indoors. You can probably do your greens indoors are pretty tolerant to being grown, but they also will grow outside. Plants that um, are vining, like um, like um, squash or zucchini or pumpkin stuff like that, you cannot grow indoors it needs the space because it's going to creepy crawly it's going to take over everything so last year we planted four pumpkin seeds and it took over i would say like a 20-foot area it actually killed everything else it was the end of the season so it was okay but it killed everything else and it grew over everything so for those types of um plants they need to be outdoors and you can train them to grow the vining ones, but for those that don't vine, you can grow them indoors, but you can also grow them outdoors. Okay, so along the lines of growing food, uh, Deborah Bernal speaks about uh, composting and wants to know, do you compost? She does mention that she does worm composting and uses it for fertilizer and to recycle table scraps. So what are your thoughts about composting? So, uh, so I don't compost, but what I do do is all my scraps, either I feed them to my chickens or I bury them in my garden. So it decomposes and then I use it when I, when I plant, but I don't compost. Okay. So composting is a procedure. It requires work. So my idea is not to be, not to have to work. It's like let nature do, do what it does. So, I mean, it's not a bad idea to compost. So I'm not saying not to, especially if you have the time, but my thought is I'm gonna put it in the ground and I'm gonna allow the earthworms and the bacteria and the fungi to do what they do, to break it down, to release the nutrients into the soil. Okay. Um, Brenda Doyle would like to know, where can we obtain non-GMO seeds for planting? Um, there's a few websites that allow you to do um, um, genetically or uh, non-genetically modified plants. They're very expensive, but what I would do, you can actually like some of the foods that you buy, you can buy like tomatoes. You can take the seeds from those. Some of the fruits and things that you can get, you can actually use those seeds to grow. But there are websites that um, you can order food that's not GMOs. And the most thing that's genetically modified is um, probably corn and the wheat and the barley are probably the most genetically modified. But a lot of the foods, uh, even the tomatoes are GMO. So, um, so it's, it's difficult to do. They, they, the ones that are not called GMOs are, are called heirlooms. And those are the ones that you'll probably want to get, but they're generally a lot more expensive. And then with the heirloom ones, what you want to be able to do once you grow them, you want to be able to save the seeds so that you can plant them again. With the GMOs, what they've done to them is that they made them so that they'll grow one time and then you won't get any seeds and able to grow a second time. Mm, okay. Um, Ronnie Edmonds would like to know, do you have recommendations on the best natural fertilizer to use in your vegetable garden? Also, do you suggest rotating vegetables greens each year or just supplement the soil and continue in the same pot or raised garden bed? 
Um, yeah, definitely. You should definitely um, rotate what your crops are. Most most things can probably grow in the same area for at least a good three to five years, I would say, before you need to start growing something else. Um, I know with us, we always grow collard greens. And because we've like used the soil so much, we started seeing um, like something called root rot on the, on the greens. So we actually just stopped farming it or stopped planting them just to give the soil a break. So in terms of an organic fertilizer, again, I don't do that. I don't have any recommendations for organic fertilizer. One of the things is use the chicken manure that came, comes out of the chicken cage and put that on the ground and let it do what it does. So but I don't necessarily go to the store and look for any type of organic fertilizer. Um, I have used miracle Grow um, to you know, kind of boost the plants, but in general, I try to be as natural as possible when I do my growing. Okay, and that goes on the lines of a question that Claudette Spence had. What kind of soil would one buy to have potted indoor vegetables? Um, they got something called potting soil. So um, miracle Grow makes a product called potting soil. Um, so that would probably be the best one. Um, with the potting soil, they're a little bit more porous, which allows them to drain. But you can go outside, dig up your yard, whatever dirt you got in there, and then mix it with a potting soil to um, you know, cut down and save money if that's something that you want to be able to do. So with the potting soil, it allows the roots to get established pretty fast and doesn't have to fight to, um, to grow. So, but um, the potting soils are generally, if you're gonna grow indoors, are pretty good. Okay, now several people asked the question related to classes. Do you do any plant walks? Do you offer any foraging classes? Um, what do you do beyond this? I know no. we talked about you presenting, but uh, do you offer any other resources for people who might be a novice or new to this? So no, I do not do any forage walks. I don't do any classes. This is just a hobby of mine that I've picked up over the years that I enjoy. But I will share if any information that I have to help someone that's interesting. There's actually a young lady on um, Instagram called The Black Forager, and she's pretty good. I've actually started following her. She actually teaches me some stuff. She's hilarious. Um, she does a lot of, um, talks about a lot of edible food. She even does stuff with mushrooms, which I'm not there yet on the mushrooms, but I personally don't do anything, uh, in terms of, um, you know, providing walks or anything of that nature to talk about stuff. When I was teaching, I actually did a class where I actually did that, but I do not. But again, you know, you're more than welcome to reach out to me and whatever information that I have, I'll be more than willing to share it with you. All right. Um, Tamara Matthews is asking, are there any groups or organizations for us to align with? So I know you just mentioned the Instagram. Um, what is it? The Black Forager? Um, the Black Forager, yeah. Mm -hmm. Black Forager. And perhaps um, family in the audience, perhaps you all might know of groups or organizations that are yeah. um, uh, farming groups, gardening groups. So please feel free to share that in the chat for everyone. Um, but Tamara also wants to know, are there standard camping water filter cleaning that's good for, to have for cleaning drinking water if you're on the go? Yeah, so normally, you know, you can go to pretty much any sporting goods and they normally have the iodine kits where you actually take the water, put the iodine in there. And then you can just drink it from a straw, which filters out whatever the particles. So there, there are a bunch of, um, you know, water purification kits that you can pick up from pretty much any outdoor store if you're outdooring like that and you're on the go. So yes, there, there, there are a lot of them, and they vary in price and size. My thing is always keep it simple. So if you really need to purify your water, the best thing to do is to boil it, and then. After you boil it, you pretty much killed any of the bacteria, allow it to cool down, and then you filter it and you can drink it. So um, 
But if you're unable to do that, normally iodine is usually one of the iodine crystals is usually placed in the water, allow it to sit for a period of time, and then you're able to drink the water. Mm. All right. Um, Roy Mill would like to know, are you prepared with backup power? If so, any ideas on generator types and setup? Yeah, uh, I, I am not prepared with backup power. Um, I'm actually, at the rate prices are going in terms of fuel right now, I'm really considering just buying a generator and just taking myself completely off the grid and then buying my fuel. Um, but I don't have a generator. I've looked into some. There are some really good ones that I've looked at. And then actually, I've seen some things where you can actually generate the power without even having a generator. So these are some of the ideas that I'm exploring. These are some of the things that I'm interested in doing because the whole electricity thing is a, is a scam as far as I'm concerned. You know, I look at my electrical bill. My electric bill is $100 of power that I consume. It cost me $150 for them, for them to deliver the electricity to my house. So I'm paying more for you to deliver it than the actual electricity that I consume. So I have a big issue, and that's one of the things that I've I've really started actively investigating. It's like, how do I get my house off the grid? Because I think we're just being scammed on electricity. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. Okay, I'm going to take this conversation um, kind of a ways and back for this next question. Um, this question comes from Todd, and he's coming from listening in from Leeds, England. And he wants to know, what does your name Kwesi mean? And as you're answering this question, I will uh, ask if you don't mind speaking a little bit to one of the points on one of your slides around mindset. And you talked about consulting shrines and ancestors um, in doing this work. Could you explain what your name means for those who don't know and then perhaps connect it to that, um, that point about mindset. All right, so um, um, Kwesi means male born on Sunday. It is a Ghanaian day name. It's a common name in um, Ghana. Everyone has a day name. Akoshua is the female version of, uh, of Sunday. Ajua, for example, is Monday. So, um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a common day name. It's a, it's a day name. So um, one, one of the things that I practice, I'm a traditional African healer. I practice traditional African culture, which um, we call it here, I guess, a comb. And um, one of the things that um, Adjuna asked me to do was in terms of um, the mindset in terms of the shrine. So as a, uh, as a practitioner of traditional religion, we have these um, spiritual entities that help and guide us. Um, and with using those entities to um, help and guide us during definitely periods of turmoil. So, but that that's part of, you know, my lifestyle in terms of how I live and how I relate with the creator. So all the things that we need uh, is, is essentially provided for us. We just have to access it. Um, oh, another book that I want to recommend to you guys to read, if you can, is Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, which talks about the takers and the leavers. And right now we're in the taker society. Capitalism is all about you know accumulating stuff and grabbing stuff and yeah, not having respect for the environment, not having respect for other people, just hoarding. And it's really, really, really not necessary. So there's anything that I want to take from this talk is that there is way more than enough to go around for everybody. No one has to be without. So I hope that answers your question or mm -hmm. Adria, you think I need to go a little bit more in depth? No, I think that, I think that, that uh, suffice. Um, so, I'm going to now just take a few more questions before we close out. And then, um, Kwesi, if you have any closing remarks, um, you can go ahead and start getting those, uh, getting those thoughts together. But someone, 
just a couple of random, uh, a couple of questions is about types of equipment to buy. So one person asked about canning jars. Um, I believe you can get those from like Target, but I don't know if there's a particular type of yeah. canning jar that you would recommend. So mason jars, yes, you can get mason jars from um, Walmart. Okay. Um, but but one of the things that I can also would also suggest you do is like the jars that you go to buy your ragu spaghetti sauce and whatever stuff that you have that comes in jars, you can actually save those and reuse them. You don't have to go out and buy jars. So this is again that mindset. So this stuff that you probably have, how many jars you throw out? How many jars have you bought that you end up throwing out that you could have reused to can some carrots or beans or whatever so but you, you can buy the jars from a walmart or a target or any of those like tractor supply type places you could buy something like that but you don't have to you can save the stuff that you have and then reuse it okay awesome awesome and just to clarify um the black forger on instagram um, someone wanted to know is the name Alexis. Uh, yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. You want to make sure that I'm the right person. So there you go, anonymous for you. And um, before, when 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 you tell her, tell her that Quasi sent her. So Quasi sent you. She doesn't even know who I am, but so <laughs> but it's fine. <laughs> do jars have to be airtight for canning? They do. So that's the technique that you need to learn how to do. So. It's not difficult, but it, it's something that you need to learn how to do. So just quickly, when you're canning something, you um, normally will heat it up and then you can either pour the hot liquid or food or whatever into the jar and then seal it while it's hot. When it cools down, it creates a seal. So that's one way of doing it, depending on the food that you're using. When I can my pick, when I can my um, eggs, I actually pour the liquid, um, the vinegar or whatever I've made, vinegar, salt, pepper, put my eggs into the jar. I take my vinegar and water combination, put it into the jar, fill it up. And then I place the whole thing into boiling hot water or I'll let the water boil. When the insides of the um, container start to boil, I then take it out and then I seal it and then allow it to cool. So when it cools, it draws a seal. And you can do that with meats. Um, like, you, know, you can do it with a lot of different types of foods. But yes, it does need to seal because that preserves it. The oxygen doesn't get in there and doesn't spoil. And it actually can hold for a couple of years. Last year, um, we made pear preserve. Um, I got, I think I got like, a, I got a bunch of jars of pear preserve and, you know, it hasn't, I'm looking at it, it still looks good, you know, but once you open it and it hits the oxygen, that's when your time is starting to tick on it, it starts to spoil. Okay, all right. Um, what is your opinion about organic produce versus non-organic produce? Mahananda Love would like to know. I think it's this marketing scam. That's my opinion. Um, the, um, the, the stuff, so America, our country, our beloved USA, um, everything comes down to a marketing scam. Organic chickens versus regular farm raised chickens. They say organic chickens, they have uh, two feet of room space, which makes them organic. And they're in a cage that has two feet of room space. So they're able to stretch their wings, which makes it organic. Really, free range chickens. I mean, so a lot of this stuff is all ploys as far as I'm concerned. It's all marketing schemes, the way they've set it up to trick you into believing that you're getting something better than what you're actually getting. So, and unless you have raised the food yourself from raised it, slaughtered it and prepared it, that's the only thing that you're gonna really get that's organic. When you grow your own food, and I challenge you to do this, grow your own tomato, 
and then get the same tomato from the grocery store. Say it's a beef boy tomato, the big fat steak tomato. Grow your own, bite that one, and then go bite another one. And they'll say it's an organic tomato and your tomato tastes 100% better. I don't get it. So what's going on? So, but I don't think, I think the, the, um, the organic labeling is just that. It's just a, a, a marketing scheme to get people to spend more money on the same thing. What are your thoughts then about farmer markets? Um, I think farmer markets are good and those individuals are pretty much growing their own food. But however, they, I mean, if they're commercially farming, I mean, they can use pesticides and things of that nature to increase their yields. But I think they're small scale. So because they're small scale, they're not gonna be as bad as the commercial guys. The commercial guys, you know, are farming hundreds of acres of land and they're controlling the pests with Roundup and things of this nature to prevent weeds and stuff from growing. And then they're putting all these artificial fertilizer on it. The small farmer's market guy is probably doing it, but not to the extent that the industrial guys are doing. So the quality of food in my mind will be better. Um, one way, I mean, if you just go to a farmer's market and get regular corn, you know, farm raised corn from like where you are, say you're in Maryland or wherever, and they got the little corn from the farmer's market, you can taste it. If you taste it and bite it raw, it generally pops and it's a sweetness in your mouth. If you get the commercial corn, it tastes like feed corn. It's totally different. You know? But I think, I think the farmer's markets are a step up. And if you even get involved with a co-op, that's probably even better. Okay. Um... A few questions around canning, and I know that canning um, you were sharing is something that you uh, do. So a question is, can you can pretty much any food? And then can you talk about storing um, the canned items? So, so that's, the, that's the whole beauty of canning. You don't need to refrigerate it. It's just like if you had or a, um, a can of corn or whatever, just put it in the cabinet. Yeah, put it in a cool storage area. I mean, just put it in the cabinet. I mean, that's the whole thing. That's the whole beauty of canning. You don't need refrigeration. That's the whole beauty of salting. You don't need to salt. You don't need to put it in the refrigerator. That's the beauty of smoking your food. You don't have to put it in the refrigerator. So, but yes, yeah, so once you smoke the, uh, or once you've canned the material, only thing you need to do is just put it in, you know, um, in into um, the cabinet, you know, a cool, cool dark area for the most part, so you don't have reactions with the light. Because normally you're using a clear jar in order for it to be done. But that's one of the one of the nice things about um, canning. You don't have to rely on refrigeration, and then the food lasts a pretty long time. All right. So cool, dark place. Great. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone who joined us this evening for um, this conversation around surviving and being able to be sovereign just at least by being able to feed ourselves. So I want to thank you, Dr. Kwesi Moa, for joining us. And I want to invite everyone to our Wisdom Wednesday lecture series. Again, it's the third Wednesday of every month. If you are not on the IKG listserv, we will place that link in the chat for you so that you can go to ikgculturalresourcecenter.com, sign up and be informed of all of our various events, including the Egypt on the Potomac field trip. The season is up and running and we do have walking field trips um, happening this month and throughout the rest of the year. So you can go to our website to learn more about those field trip opportunities. We look forward to seeing you next month where we will have our presenter, Donald Gottfried. He will be speaking on his personal journey to freedom and a little bit about his stay in Ghana. Uh, Kwesi mentioned Ghana earlier and our speaker actually, um, lived in Ghana for next our next month's speaker, uh, lived in Ghana and will be sharing about his personal journey to freedom. So we're talking about, he's talking about freedom tonight. We're also talking about freedom and sovereignty in terms of, of living off of living off of one's environment. 
Um, our next Wisdom Wednesday will be June 15th, and we definitely hope that you're able to join us. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kwesi Amoa for any closing um, remarks before we close out officially. Um, just want to say thank you for everybody for taking this time to um, listen to my opinion. I am one man in this journey. I strongly encourage you to search for your own food independence. Um, I think that is critical. I think that is critical for us to understand that when things happen based on our history with this government, that we cannot rely on the government to be able to be there for us like it is for other communities. So it is. it would be great if we, you know, we pull together as a collective and share this knowledge with each other. And I'm, I'm certainly willing to help anybody that's interested in, you know, wanting to know more and getting your own thing established and, you know, learning from there. And then we share, we share information. That's what it's all about. So thanks again. Have a great night and thank you for listening. Thank you. And again, uh, Kwesi's, uh, Dr. Kwesi Amoa's email has been placed in the chat and we will place it in the chat again for you. And um, thank you for everyone who shared your suggestions, um, organizations and groups. Um, people mentioned some YouTube channels. Um, I saw Lead Farmer, uh, a YouTube channel um, that a Black man that does a lot around this topic. Um, I've seen some of his videos and I think that's a great um, person to check out. I think it's Lead Farmer 73. But nevertheless, it's in the chat. So, you know, go through that chat and or save the chat to keep some of those suggestions. Thank you again. We uh, wish you all a wonderful evening and a great week and see you next month. Peace.